We've got a, um, there's a lot going on with NAFTA and trade and everything else happening. We've got an all-star panel and we're really looking forward to getting over to them as quickly as possible. They did tell me that I need to say uh, this is a session as a CLE accredited by the State Bar of Texas. Um, that to receive the CLE credit, they must sign in the clipboard located at the back of the room. So I guess it's right back there at the back of the room. So if that's you, please sign in after this session. Thank you all for being here. Um, my name is Dr. Vance Ginn. I'm the senior economist and the director of our Center for Economic Prosperity at the Texas Public Policy Foundation. Um, I've been at the foundation for about five years now and, and really enjoyed it. Uh, taught for a couple of years at Sam Houston State University and you know, got some of the academic life and thought, eh, you know, I, I want to make a difference in the policy world. And uh, that's what brought me over to the, the, the Texas Public Policy Foundation. You know, there's a lot of stuff that happens with trade. You know, many of us, just a few days ago, may have texted someone to say Happy New Year. Did any of you do that? Text someone Happy New Year? Or maybe you called them and said Happy New Year? Maybe it was on an iPhone like what I have here. Maybe it was on another smart one, smartphone, okay? But when you think about it, have you ever thought about where that iPhone or that smartphone comes from? Where it was produced? Okay, parts of it, parts of it could be from China. Right. But whenever so there's a good video on CNBC that talked about the, the iPhone and where it was manufactured. There are more than a dozen minerals that are inside this one iPhone. The parts that come into this one iPhone are from more than 43 countries. There are tens of thousands of people throughout the globe to, to create this one iPhone. In fact, I would argue that not one person knows how to create this one iPhone. Right. There's too many parts. There's too many minerals, too many other resources that are being used. Have you all ever read the book by Leonard Reed called I Pencil? Where it talks about the pencil, no one knows how to create one pencil, right? No one knows how to produce that pencil. When you think about the rubber, the lead, the paint, and everything else that's involved, what does all this have to deal with? Trade. Trade is essential in every one of our everyday lives. When you think about the clothes that we wear, hopefully you all have clothes on. Right? Uh, and, and, and the car that you drive and everything else that's going on, trade is an essential part of that. And we need to think about the value of trade overall. There's a lot of talk about you know, trade deficits and the amount of exports and imports and things of that nature. You know, I looked at the Census Bureau's numbers here. Um, between the U.S. and Mexico, for example, there was a $71 billion trade deficit in 2017. Just through October of this year, it was $67 billion dollars. Because the other information isn't out there. So it looks like it's going to be even wider this year. There's been talk about NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement that was passed or went into effect in 1994. And to look at the amount of jobs that were created. Y'all remember Ross Perot said we're going to hear this giant sucking sound of jobs and income and things of that nature. So Trump came in and said, look, we're going to try to do something different. We want to renegotiate it. What's that going to look like? And hopefully we can get to a place that's going to have freer trade overall. That way we can have even more prosperity in our everyday lives. I don't know about you, but I really don't want to create everything that I do on a day-to-day -day basis. Many of us may, you know, I, I don't want to know how to build a car, honestly. I don't want to know how to build a house. Something that Adam Smith talked about in 1776 in The Wealth of Nations was that you need a division of labor and specialization in order to allow for these things to come forth. And that's what we've seen in Texas. Right, as we're going to talk about today, 16 years in a row, probably 17 if you include eight, 2018, right, Comptroller? Um, 17 years in a row, Texas has been the number one exporter in the nation. We've got a lot to discuss. I'm, I'm fired up. I don't know about y'all. Um, let me introduce each one of these great panelists. We've got Comptroller Glenn Hager, Texas Comptroller. Elected Texas Comptroller of Public Accounts in November of 2014. Um, just re-elected, correct? Congratulations on that. Um, founded the state's Transparency Stars program, pushed for smarter ways of investing our rainy day fund to protect it for future generations, and guided the formation of the nation's first ever state-administered precious metals depository. Six-generation Texans who grew up farming land that has been in his family since the mid-1800s and graduated just what east of here, Texas A&M University. Uh-oh, uh-oh. I'm, I'm, I'm a Red Raider, so, but it's all right. All right. And, uh, and, his, and, and earned his law degree at St. Mary's University. Thank you for being here. Please welcome him. Next to him is Lila Afos. She is the director of the International Public Policy at Toyota Motor North America. 
Incorporated, where she collaborates with Toyota's external affairs and corporate strategy teams to develop and advocate positions on global issues. More recently, she served as the Director for Export Promotion at the Tr U.S. Trade and Development Agency. She served as this agency's country manager for the Middle East and North Africa under President George W. Bush, managing multi-million dollar portfolios of grant funds for infrastructure projects. She was also a man manager in Grant Thornton's global public sector practice. Thank you for being here. <laughs> Next to her is Representative Matt Shaheen. Woo! Oh. <laughs> he serves on the House Committees on Government Transparency and Operations and International Trade and Government Intergovernmental Affairs. I should say served, right? We don't know what the new committees will be unless you know. Okay. <laughs> Previously served five years in the Collin County Commissioner's Court, representing the citizens of Precinct 1. Consistently ranked among the top most conservative pro-business legislators in Texas. Received his bachelor's degree from Randolph-Macon College. Is it Ma Ma Macon? All right. And won all conference honors in football. Wow. Very nice. He also holds a master's degree from SMU. Thank you for being here. And last but certainly not least is Doug McCullough. Corporate, he's the corporate attorney at the Texas law firm McCullough Sudan. Policy interests include laws, regulations, and policies that affect commerce, trade, and quality of life. Co-host of the Urbane Cowboys, a podcast on policy, society, and innovation. It's also a good one. I've been on it. You might have checked it out. Podcast. Uh, and director of the Canada Texas Chamber of Commerce. Founder and executive director of the Texas Young Professionals and a National Review Institute Regional Fellow. Thank you so much. All right. Well, I'm hoping to just have a pretty good discussion here today. And um, if each one of you would kind of give your overview of what NAFTA and maybe what it means to you and um, something else that they would all love to hear. Yeah, Texas Comptroller. Be happy to. Glad to be here today. Thank you for the kind introduction. You know, if you look at the state of Texas, and this is something that I've talked about significantly over the course of the four years that I've been in this term, and one of the things that I've done while I've been in this office is the first year I decided to get out and talk about the 12 economic regions of the state of Texas, how each one of them is a little bit different, what they contribute to the economy, what are some of the potential uh, growth areas that we have in each one of those regions, and then after that I decided to focus on one area of the economy or another. And one of those aspects, it was one of the fall fall tours, was to talk about international trade here in Texas. And part of that was as we were going through the presidential election, both you had the president as well as at the time the Democrat nominee talking about NAFTA and what we need to do to change NAFTA and why NAFTA may be bad for the nation. And one of the things that a lot of people may not quite appreciate is the growth that we have seen in Texas in international trade. Mm -hmm. Most people do not realize in this state alone, much less across the nation, that Texas is the number one state when it comes to international trade out of all 50 states in the nation. Mm -hmm. And you're talking about over $650 billion in international trade, 1.6 million jobs are created here in the state of Texas. And then when you add on top of that of a $1.7 trillion economy, and when you look at Texas as an economy, the 254 counties, all the different diverse sectors of the industry sectors here in Texas. It's amazing to know that Texas economy is roughly the 10th levest and largest economy in the entire world. Mm -hmm. And so you're talking about a $1.7 trillion economy in trade. International trade contributes $240 billion to that total economy. So the point being is Texas is by far a leader in international trade. And when you ask who are our trading partners, well, interestingly enough, one to our southern border, Mexico is our number one trading partner. Number two is who is gonna be, oh, yep. actually, it's gonna be Canada. Mm -hmm. And then number three is the answer on the front row, China. Yeah. And so, you know, part of the point when I laid out the revenue estimate here a couple of days ago, uh, one of the points that I made is as we're looking to the economy in Texas in the coming next few years, one of the potential drags is not just the market, is not just rising interest rates, but as we have trade discussions, and I think it's very healthy, let me say, that we need to reevaluate our trade agreements. That is good for us and the partners that we are trading with. However, to take it and tear it up and throw it in the trash, <laughs> That's not good for Texas. You know, and, and, and one of the 29 points of entry into Texas, whether that's by sea, by land, by air, it's interesting to know most people when I say, which one is the busiest? And a lot of people think about the Port of Houston. Hmm. And Port of Houston is number two. Hmm. 
Uh, El Paso is what? Number three. Number three. Yeah. But it's good. It's right up there and extremely important to the state of Texas. And then what most people don't realize, number three is right on the border. Number one is also on the border, Laredo. Hmm. A third of the trade value, a third of the value that goes through this state is Laredo, Texas, and the number three is El Paso. Significant contributions is what NAFTA provides to this state. Thank you for that, Cobb Troller. Lila? Great. Well, thank you so much for inviting me to join you. I got to uh, make a special trip to Austin for this, and it's extra special because Texas is Toyota's home. In case you didn't know, we uh, built our North American headquarters in Plano through a multi-billion dollar uh, investment, which created thousands of local jobs. And so if you haven't been there, check it out because it is an amazing um, state-of-the-art facility. And part of the reason we chose Texas is not only is it a great state, but we make our trucks, the Tundra and Tacoma, at our plant in San Antonio. And so that's the only place in America where we make our trucks. So we're very proud of that. And uh, in case you haven't seen it, there's a great Made in Texas uh, sticker that we have in the back of each truck that rolls off the plant. And I'll make a, just a plug to do that tour because every 60 seconds there is a truck coming off that plant. Hmm. And you see somebody turning the ignition and taking it out. And it is incredible to watch. And I keep volunteering for that job. But I haven't <laughs> been successful yet. But I'm not going to stop my, uh, my efforts. But um, when you talk about NAFTA, I mean, honestly, that is so critical to Toyota's American journey because we grew up under NAFTA before it became law in 1994 on New Year's Day. So when you said, if you said Happy New Year, I thought you were going to say that that was NAFTA's birthday. Yeah. But um, it became law in 1994. Toyota only had two plants in the United States. And since NAFTA, we now have 10 plants across the country, including our largest plant in the entire world. It is not in Japan. It is in Kentucky. Georgetown, Kentucky is where we have the most employees and produce the most vehicles in, uh, right here in the United States. And so NAFTA really provided a common um, production platform across all three countries and also a common marketplace, which is so critical. And one thing I look forward to explaining today is how there really is no such thing as an American car. It's a North American car, and it really is because we were able to leverage the supply chains and the expertise in all three countries in order to make the best products. And because of NAFTA, the U.S. is an export hub for Toyota. Last year alone, we exported our U.S.-made vehicles to over 31 countries. Hmm. And NAFTA was a key ingredient in being able to do that. And our goal is to have even more trade agreements so we can export even more U.S.-made products into markets all over the world. Thank you for that. Representative Shaheen? Well, it's great to be here. I've been looking forward uh, to this. We were very excited when Toyota moved their North American headquarters to the state of Texas. I was especially excited because they moved into my district. So. <laughs> So when you come and visit, come by and say hi to me. We'd love to see you. But yeah, Toyota, which is a phenomenal experience for the state of Texas, jobs, growing our economy, those types of things. But there's a lot of examples of Toyotas. There's been lots of companies that have been moving to the state of Texas. And I think this audience appreciates we have lots of companies that are moving to the state of Texas because they're, coming, they're leaving high tax, high regulatory um, states to come to the state of Texas. McKesson just announced two weeks ago that they're leaving uh, um, California, they're coming, they're, they're, I think they're gonna actually move into Irving. So we're experiencing a lot of that. And so I, I say that because what we need to think about as a group is when we, when we talk about trade, what we need to understand about the state of Texas is we, Texas is a global economy. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're just not really just one of 50 states. We are really a global economy. Like the comptroller said, the $1.7 trillion um, economy. I think you said 240 billion um, exports. Probably about half of the exports, that 240 billion, is Mexico and Canada. So it's a substantial impact that this arrangement has. Now, I know there was a lot of people that are worried about the statements by the president with respect to throwing it out and those types of things. But what's been renegotiated, I think what we're going to find out is going to be beneficial to the state of Texas as well. If you look at the, a lot of the, the industry, a lot of the trade that happens between the state of Texas and say Mexico, a lot of that is oil and gas, petrochemical, auto parts, those types of things. If you look into the new agreement that's been reached, it ac actually broadens the area. I think probably a lot of people recognize that like Canada's dairy market c became open. He was making an issue about that to help our farmers and that type of stuff, which is good. 
But what we have to recognize is because Texas is really a global economy, right, we have a diverse economy. So we're not just an oil and gas state. I'm very grateful for our oil and gas industry and it, it pumps our rainy day fund and those types of things that we need. But we are very diverse. We are in a huge technology hub, for example, here in Austin. So if you look at the agreement, for example, things like adjusting the amount of time that, with a copyright, right? Intellectual property is a huge issue with technology. And this new agreement actually addresses those types of things. The other thing that's pretty interesting about the new agreement is it actually has a point in time when the agreement gets to be revisited, which I think is good as well. Our economy in the state of Texas is going to be very different, very different in 10 years. It's just going to be dramatically different. We probably won't be driving our own cars. God knows what artificial intelligence or robotics is going to look like in 10 years. We have a very exciting future. Our workforce is going to be dr dramatically different as well. But so as, as we have this dialogue today, I would ask you to look at our, our Texas economy as a global economy, because uh, the impact of these trade agreements is really profound. Let me take five, 10 seconds to go off subject. A lot of people are asking me questions about our new Speaker of the House in the Texas House of Representatives. Let me tell you something. We are going to have an outstanding session for the 86th legislative session. Uh, Speaker Bonin has stepped up and is really setting the stage and setting a culture in the House of Representatives for all 150 members to represent their districts. I, would exp I'm, I usually don't try to build expectations, have expectations pretty high for the, um, for the House and the Senate and for the Governor. They've already, the Speaker's already had breakfast uh, with the Lieutenant Governor and the Governor. They're going to continue that dialogue. We are very united with respect to property tax relief, uh, school finance reform. We're going to have a great session. So I wanted to put that to bed also. Well, I don't have any more questions then, right? <laughs> Thank you for that. Doug? Well, uh, thank you all for having me. Uh, you know, the I, 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 last thing I want to do is title a bunch of st statistics with uh, Comptroller Hager here, because I know he's got better data than I do. Uh, but I'll say a few things. Uh, Veronique Deruji of uh, Cato Institute just did a, a, a review of the first 25 years of NAFTA. And despite what you'd said about um, Ross Perot saying there's going to be this giant sucking sound, there, was, there were disruptions in the, in the mm -hmm. supply chain. But in the first eight years uh, following NAFTA, uh, the U.S. economy across all sectors added 20 million jobs. So uh, NAFTA we entered into in, in 1994, and there was a small company that was started in 1994, Amazon. <laughs> and uh, it is now the largest company in the world. So as we look at trade agreements, we have to understand that we can't be looking to the past. For instance, at the time that we entered into NAFTA, we were trying to be more competitive with manufacturing, but manufacturing was already way in decline. And so anything we do to sort of compare to where we were today versus 1994, we have to understand that it was already, you know, there were already trends. And at this point, what we're trying to do is we're trying to modernize these agreements to create greater free trade uh, that allows more competition, more innovation, so that we can have a forward-looking economy. Nice. Thank you for that. So, yeah. so I kind of want to start off talking about maybe the, the, the downfalls of, of trade. And it was kind of mentioned here, but what do you see as some of the costs of international trade, um, and what might we do about them? If you want you want to start there, yeah, Comptroller? Happy to. I mean, I think one of the important points is, as Doug was mentioned at the end, there are winners and losers. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is going to happen in any type of trade agreements or as you free markets up. But obviously, the whole effort is to create greater efficiencies yeah. and to make sure that people have greater opportunities as you're looking forward into the future is, is significantly uh, improving. And, and all areas have different strengths and weaknesses. And by capitalizing on that trade, you can bring all those strengths and weaknesses together. When you were talking about you know, the, the phone earlier sure. today and that nobody could uh, actually build one individually, I thought you were going to say nobody could actually use it individually. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I was like, well, I don't know how to use mine, and I got one. But uh, anyway, but that wasn't, the end. that wasn't where you were going. So uh, it was kind of like your birthday, birthday to NAFTA there. So uh, we missed that one. Oh, well. But the key point here is that by having those free trade agreements and having greater efficiencies into the system, yeah, there are going to be winners and losers. But looking into the future, there's greater opportunities that come as a result of that once we get after those initial hurdles. That'd be my initial comments. Okay. What, what have you seen within the Toyota um, and some of the, the other work that you've done 
the, the costs and benefits of these trade agreements? Well, I think it's been something that, you know, people have been very vocal about the benefits and a little bit quiet on the costs. Mm -hmm. And so there's been this lack of really transparency and openness about the realities that are faced. And we saw this with our own manufacturing industry with automation, which most of the job loss or the displacement was due, 70% of that was due to automation economists, including Vero, Veronique Delu, she's a personal friend, so I have to tell you, you quoted her. Um, <laughs> rather than uh, trade. However, we have an opportunity now to correct that and not make that mistake moving forward. And that's something that is critically important to Toyota as we see the advent of self-driving cars and these new technology, which just so you know, they're not gonna be available by next Christmas, despite what some people are saying. We still have oh. a long way to go uh, before you can uh, watch a Harry Potter movie in the back of your car. <laughs> but um, but with, because of that, we launched this initiative with several other companies, including Amazon, including UPS and FedEx and Ford and GM, looking at um, transportation opportunities in the future. And it's actually called the Partnership for Transportation Innovation Opportunities. And it really looks at sort of what are we seeing? How do we think this is going to impact jobs? Because um, as of the end of 2017, I believe there are about four and a half million Americans who earn their living by driving, whether that's truck drivers, delivery people, taxi drivers. And so we want to make sure that we are honest about the disruption this is going to cause. And how do we train them for the other jobs that are going to be created? And how do we do that? And sort of a classic economist example of disruption is the ATM machine, which now, you know, they're ubiquitous. I'm sure there's like five just in this hotel alone. But at the time, there was great fear that these ATM machines would displace so many bank tellers. But what we saw happen was that actually it led to the creation of more brick and mortar banks. And why is that? Because the ATMs provided an opportunity for people to deposit checks or get their cash. They now could train bank workers to, instead of doing that sort of more simple work, to do things like business loans, hmm. home mortgages, financial planning, and to expand their range of services. And so we can't necessarily predict what those future jobs can are going to be, but what we can do is have a transparent conversation about it and sort of the, you know, there are five pillars sort of governing this new um, partnership for transportation innovation and opportunities and really it's being commitment to innovation, like we want to move forward, we want to do what's best for society. We're, you know, one of the leading causes of death, unfortunately, remains car crashes, and so we don't want that to continue, is to really um, embrace sort of the data, like what are we seeing, what are we doing, and to share that through transparency, and to be empathetic, to really, there's winners and losers, not just folks in the winners, but being empathetic with what the situation that they face. And finally, to take action. We're not just there to write reports. We really want to use this as a way to create action and, and to not make the same mistakes we made with trade and to really use this as an opportunity to have a different conversation for the 21st century. All right, thank you for that. Yeah, I mean, of course, there's going to be winners and losers. I mean, this uh, trade agreement is dropping tariffs so the free market can work. I mean, who here has a flip phone, right? So there's going to be dynamic changes to the economy. There's going to be winners and losers. But let's always keep this in mind. Two things that I always want to tell people when we're either talking about trade agreements, advancements in technology, that type of stuff. Our unemployment rate is really low, south of 4%. What is it, 3.7 in Texas? 3.7. That is incredibly, incredibly mm -hmm. low. And I will tell you, I'm a technology guy. I have a hard time filling positions that I need to fill. And so, um, yes, there's going to be winners and losers. But even the people that are temporary losers will en end up being winners. And here's why. And you alluded to it. If you look at the different types of job titles that exist today, 50% of them did not exist 25 years ago. Mm -hmm. Let me say it again. 50% of the job titles didn't exist 25 years ago. And that's going to happen again. So, you know, we have a structure in place in the state of Texas with respect to community colleges where people can go and get retooled. We've got some great colleges. We're addressing public education. What we need to make sure as a state, right, is the individuals, our students, have a pathway to success, whether that's going to college or trade or tech school, vocational, what have you. But yes, I, but I don't think we need to be hung up on the negatives there are, but the, the, um, the benefits far, far, far outweigh the, the negatives in a trade agreement. All right, thank you, Doug. Well, and, and specifically to North America, I think the, the trade-off was essentially uh, we lost low-end jobs, and those jobs did move to Mexico. But if you look at what happened with wages, wages actually went up in the United States. So over the course of the first 20 years, um, again, the same report, Veronique DeRuji said that, um, that wages for, uh, these were uh, manufacturers, non-supervisory roles, 
uh, they went up 13% over the first 20 years. So, you know, there is a trade-off. That's the, that's the nature of economics. There's always a trade-off. So we did lose some low-end jobs, but that allowed, allowed more specialization and economy of scales. And the entire, the economy of scale, and the entire reason to do this was to become more, more competitive globally. Yeah, no, that's good. Um, one thing about it, one of my favorite economists, Milton Friedman, he always said that the best trade agreement would be one sentence, no trade barriers between the countries, period. That's it. And instead, NAFTA has more than 1,700 pages. That's, that's a lot of sentences, right? And so, I, and so maybe there's a way to renegotiate it, make it even simpler overall. So when you look at the USMCA, which is now, I think, going to be called the United States, Mexico, Canada Agreement, um, there are some things in there that could potentially be more costly, one, one could argue. When you think about it, there is a, um, for, for the auto sector in particular, 40% of the auto manufacturers have to pay their workers at least a minimum wage of $16 an hour. There's also the parts of origin which say that building this vehicle, it was 62.5% of that vehicle had to be produced in North America. Now it's going to go up to 75%. If there was a reason why they were producing elsewhere, and, um, and you're thinking about the cost of the trade and everything else, could these potentially be a more costly agreement after the deal? Or do you see that there are more benefits to the USMCA than what the current NAFTA is? There's a lot in that. Well, the overwhelming benefit is making sure that we maintain free and open trade between Canada, Mexico, and the United States, and, mm -hmm. and making and keeping that. And so, as you, meant, you alluded to earlier, you know, the threat of withdrawing from our current NAFTA before we have USMCA to replace it is a tremendous risk for not just automakers, for any industry right now. I mean, we talk about the amount of goods that flow back and forth each day, and when you and for our industry, when you have manufacturing or lean manufacturing that relies on just-in-time delivery of products and goods, so that you don't need big inventory and that you can keep things um, going. So when you go do your tour of San Antonio, which I know all of you are going to do right after this, <laughs> sign up to do right after this, is that you see like the passenger seat come down into the into the shell of the car immediately. And that's made by a supplier on our campus and they just got that and put it down. I mean, it's incredible. And so any disruption to that fine tuned uh, manufacturing is, is ex not only costly, I mean, it just causes great trouble. And again, we're exporting from the United States to all these other countries. So it's not just what it does to us here in North America, it limits our ability to, to provide to these other markets. So to a country, company like Toyota, I mean, we manufacture in 28 countries around the world. And if we have, if we're fearful about what might happen to our manufacturing in the in North America and the United States specifically, we need to look at those other markets to fill those needs for those third party countries. And so that's the greatest risk. And that's why we are very eager <laughs> to see USMCA be ratified. I mean, we just want to end the long period of uncertainty that we've had to face. I mean, that's the greatest risk for companies. I mean, we, we comply with rules. That's what we do. I mean, you tell us what the tax code tax is, rate is, we'll pay it. You know, we'll, whatever the safety rules are, actually those we far exceed. But anything else, I mean, our, our goal is to meet the rules and provide the best quality and value and, and consumer choice that we can. But if we don't know what the rules are, we can't do that. Mm -hmm. And so that's the overwhelming um, sort of a, a goal for all of us is to have that certainty. Yeah. I, I think the, it's, a, it's a real good question, right? Because every page of that agreement, that's a business decision that Toyota no longer can make or any of the corporations or small businesses in the state of Texas they can no longer make and quite frankly the statistic that you talked or the I guess the component of the agreement where 45% uh, of the vehicle or the parts need to be made by people that are making $16 an hour I mean you just you just took a big decision away from those corporations and which, which a lot of those wouldn't influence Texas right I think they're getting paid more than $16. It would mainly influence in, in Mexico, well, right? And, and that's the point I was going to make. I was, yeah, I was yeah. kind of surprised that Mexico agreed to that because it's going to force their wages to go up. But those products are going to get more expensive for us, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, in, in a perfect world, um, you know, if Ronald Reagan ran the world, right? I mean, the NAFTA would be one sentence, but or the new agreement would be one sentence. But, you know, at the end of the day, you're, you're, you're bringing two state departments together, two federal entities together, or three, excuse me, yeah. and, uh, and knocking out an agreement. So we're going to have things like that. But I, I do agree with the, with the statement that um, 
you know, the shorter the better, the, the fewer pages the better because you're just taking those decisions away from the free market, which tends to not be a good idea. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I understand the, the point about that we've, we've removed a lot of the uncertainty and it's sort of a win, except that, you know, I think we have to remember that this uncertainty didn't sort of happen to us. We are the ones that demanded the renegotiations and we spent months renegotiating, frankly, bullying our allies. And I'm not sure what we have to show for it. You've already talked about the, the rules of origin and such that are uh, going to affect the automotive industry and going to make automotive vehicles more expensive. But I'm not quite sure what else we actually that we can show from my, from a free market perspective. Uh, Scott Linscombe has estimated the the dairy market you alluded to uh, that we've gained access to a 0.34 percent increase to the access to the U.S. Uh, to the Canadian dairy market, and that's for our highly subsidized uh, U.S. dairy products. That's that's comparing not just to NAFTA, but also to the TPP, which we pulled out of. And so the point is, this is the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Right. Yeah. And I managed not to say TPPF. I know. Yeah. Uh, so, but my point is, is really that we there's a lot of cost to this, a lot of uncertainty that for business. Dis businesses are having a hard time making a decision. And the, the new agreement doesn't actually address everything. For instance, it doesn't address the, the existing steel tariffs that are still in place. Um, but I don't think that we have much to show for it, and we've actually harmed um, our diplomatic relationships with allies like Canada. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, okay. the only thing I would add to it is that every time you add another layer of a mandate or a requirement, then obviously that's taking decisions away and adding costs. But I also have to come at it from my side, and almost don't want to tell you all, as the state's tax collector, uh, oh, come at oh. it from the vantage point of, say, for example, last session. And it sounded great to do. Said, okay, for every rule you put into place, you've got to take two rules away. Mm -hmm. That's, I mean, that sounds good, and we all go, yeah, absolutely. But the thing is, is when you're the taxpayer, yeah. what was that word? You want, you want clarity? You want certainty? And one of the things that I tried to make a point with the legislature as they were going through that is that if we are putting more rules out there, it's not new rules, it's really more clarity and certainty. So in other words, I'm taking a paragraph and putting it into very descriptive languages, point one, point two, and or, which makes a significant difference, a must, a shall, a may, does that make a difference? And I said, you know, what you're going to force me to end up doing is because I'm trying to provide more clarity to the taxpayers because that's what they need. They need certainty and understanding what are the rules, the laws they passed. My job is to provide the clarity to fill in the shades of gray. And so sometimes an extra page or two might be that clarification that the taxpayer needs. Hmm. You know, rather than saying, okay, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a, take a couple rules away, but I'm just going to clump it in a really big paragraph now, which then no one's going to be able to read a word of what it says. And so I think that's really important. And, and being you've only plugged it like 10 times, the plant is really cool. Okay, I've been there and done it. So let me go ahead and add that right on top here. It is really awesome. Been there, done that. Look forward to doing it again. And, you know, well, let me go back to one point. We were talking about the disruption earlier mm -hmm. about jobs. And, and I think when you made the point of the automotive industry, and, and that's, a, that's a prime example to say because there are a significant number of people that that's what they do for a living. And there is going to be significant disruption at some point in time. But as also was said, the number of car accidents. Now, think about another disruption that's a positive side that's going to come from that is that just the same as the other day when I drove up here Sunday, my car didn't drive itself, but it sure started to tell me that I better hit the brakes really quick because somebody's pulling right in front of me, and it started slowing down for me before I could react as a human reaction, which even more goes is going to save more lives, which means, I don't know, there's a really expensive part of our society, it's called health care. <laughs> and if you take those folks out of the hospital systems, you're talking about a significant disruption on the positive side when it comes to the healthcare industry, which is really strangling all of us as far as a cost side. So there is a downside with jobs, yeah. but a significant improvement in another part of the area of the economy that we need help in really bad to contain healthcare. Costs. You must have a nice car. Mine doesn't do that. <laughs> hey, man, you know, control, <laughs> controller roll is nice. <laughs> 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 Well, one thing about it we know is that the Texas economy continues to expand at a rapid rate. And our job creation just in 2018 was more than 350 or 1,000 jobs that were added at a rate of 3%. You look at California, their rate was only 1.8% during that same period. 
Um, you look over the last decade, basically since the Great Recession, Texas has created 22% of all new jobs over that period of time. It's just phenomenal what's happened here in Texas. When I was looking at some of the data from the Census Bureau between Texas and Mexico and the amount of trade that happens, it's about $98 billion in 2017, $98 billion in exports, which is greater than the next 10 countries combined. Right? You have 89, about $90 billion in imports, which is, next to, uh, which is greater than the next five countries combined, which, uh, which is a $9 billion surplus. We actually have a $9 billion surplus. With, with Mexico. You know, the thing that I like to say is we don't, Mexico and America don't trade. Me Mexico and Texas don't trade. Texans trade with Mexicans, right? We don't get into these exchanges unless we both mutually benefit from them. So you have to think about, okay, what are the costs and benefits associated? So whenever I think about the Texas economy, I want us to be as free and as prosperous as possible. So Comptroller, you gave us a great biennial revenue estimate um, earlier this week, Monday. And um, I wondered if you could go over a little bit about that and, and what you see in the Texas economy, and then we can kind of reflect off of that. Yeah, I'd be happy to. I'll try to make it kind of real quick. Is If you look back over the course of the last year and a half, Texas essentially, if you want to look at the revenue streams into the Treasury from a tax perspective, but also as a deriving factor of the economy, has really been through what you'd almost simply say is a boom. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Texas economy has substantially grown from when we had that slight downturn in the oil industry and the manufacturing industry, which are two of the significant industries here in the state of Texas. So with that contraction in 2016, it's amazing to know that certain areas of the state continue to grow well. Some of the areas of the state contracted pretty significantly. And the state as an overall had zero growth. I mean, which is really the first time Texas has not had growth and has not outpaced the national average. Now, since that time, we have rebounded to where we substantially outpaced mm -hmm. the national average. We've had significant growth. When I closed the books in August of last year on last fiscal year, our revenues into the Treasury from a sales tax perspective were 10% higher than they were the year before. Mm -hmm. You take oil and, and natural gas severance tax collections, if I recall correctly, were 46 and 54% higher than they were the year before. Mm -hmm. So we've seen significant upticks in activity throughout the state of Texas. As you mentioned, job gains right now is over 350,000 jobs created last year, where when I gave that same report two years ago, it was 170,000. Yeah. So significant improvement in the economy during that time period. So as the Treasury, we see an 8.1% 8, 8 increase in revenues into the Treasury compared to the biennium that we are concluding right now in the next nine months. So from a budget perspective, it's much healthier. But when I said, when I gave that revenue forecast, I also said, don't expect the economy to continue to be in that boom. Now, in part, because we're comparing ourselves to new highs. Yeah. And, and one of the data points that I, that I share quite frequently is Texas had a historical month. If you go back to November of 2015, and that historical month was from a sales tax perspective, we had $2.6 billion in collection. First time we've ever had that. Hmm. In the last 12 months, I think we've uh, had, what about three? 2.6 billions, six 2.7 billions, 2.8 billillions, and wow. 1.2, 2.9 billion, hmm. which was this shy from being 3 billion. So the point is the last several months has been significant increases, but we expect Texas is gonna moderate to back to our normal pattern of growth. And my job for a revenue estimate that doesn't start for nine months from yeah. now and ends two years later, you know, so I'm like the Wizard of Oz. I come behind my <laughs> curtain. I give a press conference. I say what it's going to be, and I go back behind my curtain and go, oh, my God, I hope this is right. <laughs> so we almost we, had a curtain for you. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, you peek out of it. And, and I make that point is because there's not a person in this room with 100% yeah. certainty can estimate how much money will come into your personal house. And that's as personal to you as anything. This doesn't start for nine months and ends two years, much less for the economy the size of Texas. So, you know, our job is to look at the data and, and correct it as we see those corrections coming forward for the legislature. And, and we normally paint this with some clouds of question marks mm -hmm. because of that long time. But this one I've painted with more clouds than we have before because really a couple things. One, you look at the stock market last year, the markets really wasn't that good of a year. Mm -hmm. Also, if you look at trade agreements, which is disproportionately has impacted Texas than other states, as we're all talking about, interest rates are slightly going up. And so when you to total all that together, there's a few more clouds in the next couple of years than, than I've seen in the prior two legislative sessions when, when I was in this role. But I will say this, if 
when, when, not if, we have a downturn in the global economy, which will impact the na national economy and impact the state economy without a doubt because we're tied to the global economy. When we have that contraction, Texas is poised that we will outgrow when we come out of that at a faster pace like we have in the past. So Texas yeah. is poised continue to grow. It's just the question, when are we going to have that global hiccup, which is going to come at some point in time? No, that, that's really good. Thank you. And I, I think, too, it's part of the Texas model, right? <laughs> we think about limited government, low taxes, no personal income tax. I think we like that. Uh, less regulation overall. You know, we're thinking about spending relief and property tax relief and other things that are going on. But I wonder from some of them, from like Toyota, what are some other policies that could help us to be even more competitive? Because I think that's what's helped us in Texas to be more competitive and allowing for this growth to happen. Are those some things that you look at that maybe we could kind of pinpoint and see what could help us to be, grow even faster? Oh, absolutely. And that's precisely why Texas is our new home and we're lucky enough to be here now. I think, you know, along the lines of what we discussed earlier is really like training for the workforce of the future. Mm -hmm. And making sure, I mean, a lot of classrooms are still learning things the way they did when I was in third grade, which was not that long ago, but no. long enough. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like last week. But, yeah. um, so, but that's really important and really fundamentally restructuring how we think of education and just how we think of jobs. I mean, there's, there's this uh, almost like this view that manufacturing is somehow like dirty or, it, you know, it's, it's something's wrong with it or, it, you know, you're a blue collar worker instead of a white collar worker. You know, I come from a family of... I'm the youngest of six kids, and I'm one of the only. And me and my other, my sister close to me are the only ones who went to college. Mm -hmm. So my, you know, we come from a family of farmers and, and entrepreneurs, and so a lot of my family works at factories throughout the Midwest, and you know, the and John Deere factory in Waterloo, Iowa, and these are pristine factories. I'm not just going to talk about Toyota, San Antonio plant. You know, I'm trying <laughs> to get 15 mentions, but um, but you know, they're, they're pristine, and these are really these are high tech jobs. These are not just putting like a using a wrench to put something together. These are really and they pay really really well and Toyota has a tremendous um, workforce training program where we've partnered with 50 community colleges across the country to create this apprenticeship program where we say hey you know what we want to make sure that you're learning like the state of the art technology and how to use this and so we'll have you come into our plant and are going to be rigorous it's not going to be easy we're talking about six days a week several hours a day we want to make sure these kids have hustle and I say kids I mean you know all the way up mm -hmm. many veterans as well that come through this program and starting out of our one um, tech program working at our plant in Kentucky, they can make up to $80,000 a year. That is a heck of a salary in Georgetown, Kentucky. So I think it, it's, it's a lot, education is huge. I mean, obviously yeah. things like regulatory, you know, freedom and, and the low tax rates and, and things like that. And, and trade is the other big component of that because, you know, on, although we pulled out of the uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership, the el other 11 parties did not, and that went into force on December 30th of last year, and so they're moving ahead, and then on February 1st, you're going to have a trade agreement between the European Union and Japan enter into force, and so you've got all, nearly two-thirds of the world economy moving forward and, and limiting um, trade barriers, that, and these do not include the United States, and that's mm. something that we need to see change. Yeah. You know, uh, and listen to the comptroller, and just, I always get excited when we talk about the economic growth of the state of Texas, yeah. we got to remember the state of Texas experienced a catastrophic event, right? The hurricane yeah. that hit us. And despite that, I mean, I, I go back, we were, we were, uh, all of us were very worried about the impact. We, we looked at the economic impact of early, earlier hurricanes with respect to Louisiana and Mississippi and how long it took their states to recover. Mm. Uh, it's just it's such a testimony to Texas and how uh, we're recovering. And, and, and that'll be part of the, uh, some of the uh, issues that we handle with respect to the, this legislative session is uh, what, what is everything that the state needs to do as, as far as the recovery mm -hmm. um, with that. And, um, but so it's just amazing. The other thing is, as far as the workforce, I look at our workforce and education as our, that's, that's our economic development. The reason why Toyota, uh, all these companies, McKesson, they're coming to the state of Texas, yes, low taxes, yes, low regulation, absolutely, and I don't want to discount that. But they're coming here because of our workforce. That's, that's you all. And by the way, if there's any teachers um, in the audience, we owe you a debt of gratitude. Our teachers are the ones that are creating our next workforce. But that's why, again, you're hearing a lot of discussion uh, this legislation about, uh, this legislative session about education, because it's so important. Here's another thing to think about. Um, that quite frankly we need to be a little bit con concerned as Texans is our birth rate. Hmm. Our birth rate 
uh, is will not sustain our economic growth that we want. And so immigration to the state of Texas is important, legal, obviously, but that immigration is vitally important. Hmm. Um, and what's great is we are attracting awesome talent. So I, I tend to talk to a lot of the folks at Toyota uh, quite a bit because they're in my district, like I was saying earlier. But one of the things that Toyota likes and a lot, lot of these other companies like is when people move to the state of Texas, they love it. They lo and Texas is awesome, right? Can I get an amen? <laughs> And so we're able to attract, you know, great talent. I mean, I grew up in Virginia and moved to Texas, and I got boots. I got as quick a truck. as you could, right? You should as see my belt could. buckle. It's pretty awesome. But so, um, just with disres respect to our, our overall economy um, and the importance of our workforce. Uh, and the other thing I'll, I'll scare the audience a little bit is, is when you look at demographically the. Um, the areas of the state of Texas that aren't performing well, our graduation rates are, are low, um, or lower percentages that are going to college, those are actually our fastest growing populations in the state of Texas. Mm -hmm. So that's why you're hearing the governor uh, talk a lot about the, increasing the percentages of people that have at least two year certificates, if not four year college degrees. I don't want to discount um, vocational, technical at all, I'm not. Mm -hmm. um, but the reality is the types of jobs that the state of Texas is attracting is high paying jobs. Mm -hmm. And not only just people on the manufacturing floor, but because, because of the advancements in technology, robotics, artificial intelligence, we need more engineers, right? We need more scientists, those types of things. And so you're gonna see um, not only investments from a, from a state perspective with, with, respect, with respect to education, but that immigration is gonna continue. We're stealing talent. We're still in talent from around the globe, and that's a good thing. Nice. Thank you. So, so the Fraser Institute, uh, they just came out with You the, read a lot of studies. I've I noticed. read a lot of studies. <laughs> so, so this is one. It's their Economic Freedom of North America Index. And Texas is doing pretty good. We, we rank number three. How many of you ever brag about finishing third in anything? Yeah. So <laughs> what, what, one of the, the things that's holding us back, and it's one of the, so another report, uh, the Tax Foundation, uh, they, they, they say that our margins tax is one of the most uh, cumbersome types of taxes. And so what they're, what they're suggesting is that if we were to eliminate the margins tax, replace it with something else, obviously, uh, maybe not, growth. obviously. Growth. Growth. Reduce spending. Yeah. But if we, were to, if we were to eliminate the margins tax, that would actually improve the Texas competitiveness. Mm -hmm. That's good. Yeah, so, so let's see what else. So we have, there's a lot of, also a lot of discussion about China. I think we'd be remiss if we didn't at least discuss that a little bit and what's going on with, with tariffs um, and the, the tariffs on steel, the tariffs on aluminum, the tariffs on about $200 billion worth of products and how that may increase here soon. We may go all the way, all $500 billion of the, the amount of, this is from all of the, the United States, not just Texas, I'm gonna say $200 billion. There's a lot of talk though about what's going on with China. How has maybe some of those tariffs influenced Texas? And what might else we do besides raising taxes on Americans in order to overcome some of these issues like intellectual property rights and things of that nature. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, so uh, there, there's an expression about that every problem looks like a nail if the only tool you have is a, a hammer. And I think that right now we feel like the only tool we know how to use is a hammer. Um, there are more effective, you, you, for instance, you talk about IP. Um, you know, and I'll, I'll make, make one quick aside. That's a situation that we, uh, an issue that we have with, uh, with China that we don't have with Canada and Mexico. And yet we're using the same type of approach of, of tariffs. And so I think that, you know, in my world as, a, as, a, as a, an attorney, you're always looking for a specific approach that's narrowly tailored to a specific problem. In the case of intellectual property, we could be dealing with that with China through uh, restrictions on exports, on the CFIUS reviews, and things that, and, and WTO um, proceedings. And another study, um, Cato <laughs> Institute says that in every, in every case uh, brought against China where they lost, only in one case did they just disregard it. Hmm. So WTO proceedings actually do have merit. So anyhow, the point of my, my point really is, is that we need to do more than just try to attack every problem that we, every concern we have about with trade with just tariffs. Nice. Any other thoughts? What, what, what about the, the Trans-Pacific Partnership? 
What if we were able to get back into that and renegotiate it? Maybe the Obama administration did a poor job. I, I don't know. But let's say Trump came in and renegotiated that. That's 40% of the global economy. Might that put more pressure on China to liberalize some of their trade practices or, or not? That, well, that was actually uh, the, the, the catalyst for negotiating the Trans-Pacific Partnership was a way to sort of put a ring around China and write the rules of trade for Asia Pacific before China had the opportunity to do so and to really make sure that the U.S. didn't lose out. And so what we see now is, you know, tension between the world's two largest economies and, and, our, and, and one of the reports I've read <laughs> about talks about are we going to have this bifurcation? Mm -hmm. of the world economy, whether you're either with the U.S. or you're with China. And the only thing I just wanted to add is, is we talk about tariffs, you hear tariffs, 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 and just it's always good when you're speaking with people just to remind them of what tariffs are and what they are not. They are a tax on consumers. They are not paid by foreign governments. They are not paid by foreign people. They are paid by American companies and consumers. That's who pays tariffs. So I always try to say that because people think they know what they are and sometimes they don't always on that. Sure. And to just make a point I wanted to make earlier that one, one of the tours I took was talking about manufacturing. Mm -hmm. and, and the reason I did that was, again, during the elections, we were talking about, oh, the jobs will never come back. And, and if you look at the data in the last 20 years, you know, here in Texas, yeah, unfortunately, manufacturing jobs have gone down 19%. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that, that's pretty eye-popping to you. But the reason I did that is because in manufacturing, our R&D and our GDP output into this state has gone up by 89%. Hmm. So the point I'm talking about is what metric are you looking at? Mm -hmm. If you just looked at the jobs, you go, oh my gosh, they're not here. <laughs> but then if you look at the GDP output, you go, wow, I think I want that plant here. I'd like to have a couple of more of those plants. And then also when you look at the number and value of exports, where is it coming from? In that industry. Hmm. A significant improvement and so my point being is look at all the data not just one point and take that more rifle approach in trying to solve the problems in the sledgehammer the sledgehammer really doesn't work that well yeah that's a great point and I mean a lot of it in the manufacturing is through new innovation right? when you have innovation and productivity you don't need as many workers so some of that happens we've well, seen over the last year across the United States uh, Chuck DeVore He's wrote some, some good research on this showing the number of manufacturing jobs, more than 300,000 jobs, manufacturing jobs across the United States, right? And part of that due to, I think, the Trump tax cuts, lowering the top corporate rate from 35% to 21% um, has helped contribute to some of that as well. So speaking of data points, our time is almost up. So I want to turn it over to all of you uh, for the questions that, that you have about NAFTA and some other things that are, that are going on. And there is a microphone that's coming around and please turn your brief comment in, into a question so we can have multiple people uh, ask questions. Um, let's see. All right. That's, that's, yes. All right. My question is, well, thank you for all of you because all of you just gave a lot of insight. My question specifically is, do you see necessarily that it was uh, be beneficial or not for the NAFTA agreement to change the name of it because it incurs on expenses when at the end of the day, what the NAFTA needed in the last time that I was at a, a policy um, with the TPPF, we talked and heard about it. Um, we knew that NAFTA needed reviews mm. because it was just outdated and we just needed to do some changes. But why the change of the name? What is your personal opinion of what they did uh, from Washington on regards to that? For those who don't really understand as well as you do what NAFTA was all about, why they did it um, over 25 years ago, was that needed, the I'll, change of the name of it? I'll, I'll answer it from this perspective, is that I still can't even recall what the new name is. Yeah. Um, but I can recall NAFTA. Now, and let me get, answer it this way is that amazingly to me is here in Texas, if you asked people, citizenship of the state of Texas, is NAFTA good or bad? And we've, you've heard all the numbers, you've heard all the data, and I, I do a poll of you now, but I think most of you would say, yeah, it's been pretty good for Texas. A lot of economic output, a lot of jobs have been created. But if you ask people in Texas, they'd still say, that thing is bad. So there's a connotation there. So sometimes changing a name 
eliminates that connotation and we move on to the next issue. So that, I mean, that's, that's my point of view from it. It's still amazing as I get out and talk about it and people go, you know, before a room, before I start talking, they're like, that thing is bad. <laughs> Until you talk about the data and the numbers and they go, ooh, maybe that's so good after all. But that's, that's my opinion on answering the question. You know, thoughts? If, well, I have a, a friend that uh, just, just made a comment to me in a different context that said that President Trump is kind of like somebody on QVC. Within one minute, they can tell you that you have a problem that you don't even know, and that within one minute, they can tell you the solution to it. And so I think in, in this case, I think you're right. There's very little difference between the NAFTA plus TPP. There's some provisions drawn from TPP. But at the, at the end of the day, it's really the same agreement, even though we renamed it. Yeah. Yeah. Right here. Thank you. A quick kidding comment, agreeing with almost everything that four of you have said. Um, but you are right, That's Glenn. the four of us, but not Vince, That's right? right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Let's make that clear. <laughs> Except the moderator. In that case, three of you. Um, <laughs> having lived in Illinois for 60 years, one kidding comment, Glenn, you're right. NAFTA's got pluses and minuses. Sure. Now, I'm not going to mention Illinois. The state's run by idiots, and the unions are unbelievably militant. I'm going to leave that out. But NAFTA's got good points and bad points. I'm a Texan now, so I think it's wonderful. But my second question that, and this is what was important, the point of origin, there are a couple predator economies. China's obvious. Japan, people forget. Japan's a real predator economy. And Angela Merkel in Germany are no friends of ours these last years. China, for so long, has been slipping things into Mexico that then Mexico is shipping into the United States as if they were Mexican products, when in reality we're just subsidizing China more. How do we in NAFTA protect ourselves from the predator economies who are trying to fit around the outside? It's a bigger issue than NAFTA. But we got some predators out there, and as a retired Army colonel talking about it, national security with all the tech center in Austin and the tech center we have here, and a lot of the military and national security stuff we produce in, in uh, Texas, we got to think about the national security side, too, All right. with a predator like China. That's a big issue. Any response to that? I would just say that sort of, it's all about, you know, you can have these rules and regulations, certification requirements, but it only work if they're enforced and they're overseen. And I think mm. that's an important thing. And we have a very extensive compliance operation of multiple people in multiple countries that check every box and everything and make sure that that doesn't happen. I think that's, everybody needs to follow that as well to make sure that we, we don't allow free riders, if you will, on, on these trade agreements. Representative Shaheen, are, is there, are there things that the state legislature can do to, to influence some of these, maybe the decisions that are going on here, or other things that you look at on the committee that you've been on the, in the past? Well, I, I, I mean, I served on international relations, right. but um, I mean, a lot of that was just recognizing the impact of Mexico and Canada. I think um, so what the state can do is with respect to our border, and that um, although that's a federal responsibility, the state of Texas has been forced into a situation where we're actually spending a significant amount of state taxpayer dollars um, on the border, about $800 million a year of your tax, tax dollars we're having to use on the border. So from a state perspective, it's just making sure that um, trade is not interfered with, the moving of, of goods and services are free-flowing. If you look at um, oil and gas, for example, I mean, we're pretty integrated with Mexico, and we have pipelines from Mexico into Texas, so we got to make sure that there's no disruption. The other thing I would say is that our, we got to maintain, as a state, our um, investments in infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So it's not with a trade agreement, but with all this growth, right, we need to make sure that our infrastructure with respect to roads and water and all those types of things that we got to maintain. Otherwise, people will stop coming here as well. So we don't want every place in the state of Texas to be like Austin traffic. It'd be a nightmare. <laughs> so it's True. incumbent upon the state. Otherwise, these agreements are going to obviously be negotiated by, by the feds. Yeah. Let's see. Right in the back. Sure. Let's see. Do you think it's fair to say that Trump probably the lead pro free trade and that we that? I didn't. Will we oh. return to a what? I'm sorry. So, more free trade. Uh, you know, I guess I'm the official Republican. Oh, no, you're the official Republican, too. 
Um, I guess the only thing I'll say is Trump is very much a, a unique animal out there. <laughs> And uh, it's dangerous for me to go beyond that. Um, I, I, I think, I don't know if he's not pro trade. I think what we're trying to get our arms around is how he negotiates. Um, it's funny, I, w I moved my, my capital office and we, were, we were had boxes of books and books because we, we were just moving stuff. And believe it or not, 25 years ago, I bought his book, right? Yeah. And if you actually Martin, go yeah. back and look at that book, a lot of the stuff that he's doing, he tends to throw bombs to establish his negotiating position and then yeah. bring people to the table. So, uh, and me, and I guess probably everybody's trying to figure out, is he really less pro-trade or is that just the way he negotiates? So, I think a lot of things are gonna get back to normal once Mr. Trump is, is done, done serving. I mean, one thing I will add is that if you look at the discussion from an after perspective, say for example, and you look at the the Midwest, the Rust Belt, for say, we were talking earlier about how disruptions are coming and looking past, looking forward. A lot of those jobs that were leaving those areas and moving, some of them moved to other parts of the world. Some of them actually moved in the United States South. Mm -hmm. They moved from states that were very labor organized, very structured in a manner that you're moving to states that have the right to work. And in fact, that's why a lot of manufacturing is moving to Texas, Kentucky, Tennessee, southern states, and a lot of that disruption. And so, you know, I think that a, a lot of politicians, as they're in the area, regardless from the party, need to kind of make sure they're really educated on the issues, which is why I was talking about manufacturing. And if you just look at job counts, you go, oh, we don't want any of it. Mm -hmm. But if you look at far as GDP output, yeah, we need some more of that here. And the high paying jobs may not be the same number of jobs that are there in the past, but by God, the ones that are paying, they're paying really good, and that's the ones that we want. And so I think, you know, it's really important for us as a citizenship, too, to be a very educated so we kind of understand the issues because we need to be very more trade-oriented. Trade but, you know, when it comes to China, I mean, for, for just to talk on this, we have to do something about the intellectual issues going on in China. You know, for companies that go there and say, okay, you can do business here, but you're going to set up and do business with this company, and by the way, give them all your intellectual trade and capability, that, that is not good for this country. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I don't know exactly what the president's efforts are, but if anything, nothing else, trying to make sure that we crack down on that disruption of that tr flow of that knowledge, that American-created knowledge, and essentially just handing it over to other countries, that has got to change significantly, and, and hopefully that's what really what a large part of this is about. And you know, when we talk about China, let's not forget, they are a huge human rights violator. Mm -hmm. And we cannot forget that, and we tend to bifurcate these discussions. I think with respect to China, we need to treat them differently than obviously in Mexico or Canada. And one of the great things I think you brought up, Comptroller, was on what's happening in the South, like right to work, for example. One of the beauties of federalism is the laboratories of competition. So it allows for us to have these lower taxes and less regulation in certain areas. Doesn't mean it's not just as sensible, it's probably more sensible regulation, um, but you're making sure that the environment is kept safe and things of that nature, which happens under capitalism um, and not socialism, right? And the more prosperity that you can have overall as well. Um, other, other questions? We have, we have several right up here. Let's go, let's go right here. We'll get around, we have stuff. <coughs> um. The U.S. Trade Representative put out a report several years ago where they showed the, um, I guess it would be the recycling rate of every dollar that we exported to China or we imported from them would lead to nine cents in incremental American exports. For Mexico, that number is 39 cents. That was for the U.S. as a whole. Based on the data that, uh, Lyle, you cited earlier, my guess is that in the case of Texas to Mexico, it's substantially higher. So one would think that that's trade with Mexico is very beneficial. Question I have specifically is with the um, uh, new version of our trade agreement with with Mexico and with Canada. Um, what are we? Go what is in there that you folks know about that is going to induce lo logistics chains to move things from China to Mexico, back to America, and to Canada? Hmm. Anyone like to? 
I'll turn to the rest of the panelists because I'm not an expert on what all the new changes are. So I'd just be making stuff up and I don't want to be one of those guys. Well, I think, I think the, the yeah. primary mechanism is I think, I think the real focus was on automotive. And yeah. so it's the rule rules of origins that we talked about where uh, the, the, the local content requirement within North America went from 62 to 75 percent. So that's the, that's, the, that's the main answer, I think. I'll just add to that that companies, when they make long-term investment decisions, because we talk about building a plant, that's five to seven years to build the plant. You've got to do the siting, the environmental work, you've got to find your energy supply, your ports, your suppliers, you know, all that type of stuff. But then when you build that, you're looking at a 20 to 30 year life cycle. And so looking at, I mean, you're looking long term at everything and not just sort of the fundamentals of that particular place where you're building it, but where you can export and where you can go to. And so if it makes it more expensive, it makes it hard. If there's more boxes you have to check or more pages you have to go through, I mean, it, it just makes it more complicated to make those decisions. And during this process, whenever they were negotiating the, NAF, the new NAFTA deal, USMCA, I was talking to a lot of business owners who have do business across the border, and they just wouldn't do business. Right, because you do have these longer-term contracts where, you know, how much was that was slowing down economic growth by, during this negotiation process? Right now, we didn't mention this earlier, but the USMCA is currently being under review by those in Congress, also those in Mexico and in Canada, and then, so they have this under um, this is the uh, Trade Promotion Authority. So they have 90 days in order to review. So it's been I don't know, maybe 40, 45 days now. Well, they need the I so. Just a part of that yeah. for these like uh, these uh, milestones you have to hit in order to we get to the ratification of USMCA or NAFTA 2.0 is that um, the ITC, the International Trade Commission, has to do a report on how does mm -hmm. this uh, impact the US economy, these new provisions, and so really def sort of trying to forecast what that might be. But of course they're furloughed so with yeah. the government shutdown, so they'll delay that report, which will delay. Yeah, yeah it's, it's quite interesting all the different components that are going into it. Um, so we have still some time with which to see how this is going to come out. I, mean, I don't think we know all the details. One of the positive things, we haven't talked a whole lot of positive things about the New Deal, but one thing that was added in there was lowering trade barriers, basically making it zero for digital trade. Because digital trade, I don't know if you know, but it didn't really happen in 1994 <laughs> and before. So that really wasn't in the agreement at all. And that's one thing that was added that's actually very free trade, saying, look, there's not going to be trade barriers. It's an excellent trade. The digital trade, yeah, exactly. The internet was in its infancy when right. the first NAFTA was written. So that is a really strong chapter. Yeah, yeah that's a good point. Um, what else? I guess we'll come right here. <coughs> well, other people want to hear you, though. And we're recording. OK. Uh, my question is uh, primarily to Lila and also to the rest of you about bilateral agreements. So Japan, you know, because we're not in the uh, the TPP, you know, what does that look like for you? And then, you know, if, if her company headquarters is in your district, you know, how do you uh, finesse that where you get your feedback, you know, to the legislatures and then try to, you know, influence that? I'd be curious, you know, to hear how that process works and then what you think of uh, the bilateral deals and what how that might impact Toyota in Texas. Well, I speak for Toyota North America, so uh, we look at it from like what would it do specifically to our U.S. operations. And really, I mean, the thing about TPP is you not only had the U.S. and Japan, but you had you know t uh, ten other countries, including Canada and Mexico. And a lot of people do think the new NAFTA, as you said, as you referenced, like just borrowed heavily from TPP, so we could have saved maybe a lot of time and effort. <laughs> we just sort of did that. And um, whereas you're on the cusp of entering this, you know, the Trans-Pacific Partnership and also a trade deal with the European <laughs> Union, TTIP, which is a bit behind on um, then uh, TPP. Yeah. We're now at the very early stages of negotiating trade agreements with the EU and Japan. And technically, the U.S. can sort of sit down to formally talk with both of them uh, at the end of this month or, or February. I think it's interesting to watch Davos. Again, if the shutdown ends, people can actually go to the World Economic Forum to see when that happens. But, uh, you know, there's a lot of pressure on, on these talks, of course, and what, what could happen. And I think if we look at what happens during the uh, NAFTA renegotiation, it's sort of illustrative and what might be the things that come up during these bilateral talks. And for both the European and Union and, J and Japan, a big issue is the threat of tariffs on all auto imports, which was done under an, the same sort of obscure trade provision that was used to impose tariffs on steel and aluminum, Section 232, which uh, it could enable the uh, government to put a 25% tariff on anything related to autos entering the United States, whether that's a finished vehicle, whether it's a part, a component, anything. And so that investigation 
uh, findings need to be released by mid-February, and so that's right around the time that these trade talks could happen. So it's, it's, it's you know, be interesting to see how all those dynamics um, come together. Yeah. I think we might have time for one short question, right here. All right, thank you. Hi, right, thanks again. So, yeah, that's right. simple question. Given the new Congress in Washington, what is the likelihood that the USMCA will actually pass and be ratified? Thank you. What do y'all think? Thank you. Doug? No. I, I, I'm not really sure. And the, the reason I say that is uh, I don't know if the Democratic Congress really wants to pick a fight over this because I think that Donald Trump would probably go ahead and pull out of NAFTA. And I think that they probably have other battles they want to fight. So it's probably easier for them just to go ahead and approve it and move on to other things they want to do. I gave up trying to figure out Congress a long time ago. I don't, I don't know what those guys are going to do. I think the government shutdown doesn't bode well, but um, we, we hope that ultimately we do see USMCA ratified. I think to your point, NAFTA is so critical to our economy. And if there is the threat that not, it's not a choice between the new NAFTA and the old NAFTA, it's a choice between the new NAFTA or nothing, everybody will do what they can to make sure that we do have some sort of framework for North America. Anything? No? All right. Well, I think we've heard a lot about trade in general and the influence that it has on our everyday lives and just the amount of prosperity that it really supports over time. We've known about this for centuries. It's just a matter of how do we get freer trade? How do we reduce trade barriers? How do we have policies in place in states like Texas that are going to allow us to be more prosperous? And that's some of the things that I think we're going to have a great session. Representative Shaheen said earlier on doing some of these things like property tax relief. Um, I think about spending relief too. I think sometimes we spend too much. Um, but those are some of the key things that we want to think about. And so the next time that you are texting from your smartphone, think about how many other countries all of that goes into that one particular phone. All the people that that really employs and the amount of voluntary exchange that that creates. I mean, sure, there are some places that don't, don't practice those same good policies like in China. And we need to have some sort of way to pressure them to move to more liberalized sort of economies. But let's think about the things that we do have here in the United States, in Texas, and not take it for granted. Thank you for all your time. There are CLE hours. There's a folder in the back. If you'll please fill that out. And uh, in the governor's ballroom directly after this will be Lieutenant Governor giving his presentation and speech. Thank you all for being here. Thank our panel.